Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I can see we've got uh, Gary there. Uh, blue skies, nothing but blue skies. Um, you want to come here? You can have a little bit of variation in the sky in this place if you like, Gary. It's, it was blue skies, but it's quite chilly. It's about 11 degrees out there. Good morning, uh, Michelle and Miss Connie. Good evening. Uh, progress in the garden? Yeah. If you look carefully at my hands, you can see an awful lot of scratches <laughs> where those, those wretched brambles have taken their revenge upon me. Good on them. Uh, Penelope, good morning. Good morning to you as well. Uh, Penelope mentioned, I think, about um, the, the ground elder that's there. Apparently you can eat ground elder. I'm not quite sure what part of it you eat. I ought to look it up. There's plenty growing away, but I'm smothering it with thick layers of cardboard, which we use to move into the house. And then on top of that, a big thick layer of uh, mulch, which is made up of the chipped up things that are taken out of that big border, mainly for Scythia, but also an absolutely enormous amount of dead blackberry bush which are even more prickly and ghastly anyway there we go <laughs> i'm definitely not moaning it's been very good indeed for me good morning greg and suzanne nice to see you over the weekend well done for getting here uh, anton good morning happy tuesday to you as well and also to bev and i see that teresa is there as well god bless you and keep you the garden is looking very pretty. I tell you what is looking very pretty. There, there are um, two, maybe three even, um, cherry trees. One is a fruiting cherry and one is a flowering cherry. Both of them are very big. Both of them really, uh, the flowering cherry particularly, probably reaching towards the end of its life. It's getting to that point where it's beginning to say, oh, I'm not going to feed this branch anymore, this branch has had it. <laughs> uh, and at some point it'll probably need to be cut, cut down. The other one is magnificent and absolutely enormous, um, full of flowers, who are very different, much more delicate, far prettier. It's a pity the two have been put next to each other because separately they're both beautiful, but together the one slightly takes away the joy of the other one. The pear tree it's absolutely full of flower as well. It'll be interesting to see if that actually comes to anything. Um, and uh, then there are, the, there are a couple of apples, both of which are full of disease. Um, I may have to harden my heart about these apples. Perhaps I can do a, a really severe cut on them. I'll see what the fruit is like in the, in the autumn. If it's nice, it might be worthwhile trying something out is seeing if we can bring it back to life. Anyway, there we go. Uh, it to be in England now that April's here. <laughs> it's meant to be May. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really matter. Whatever, today we're going to be looking at what happened next. St. Peter is at the house of Cornelius, the centurion, who has brought all, all of his family and friends or nearby. Um, and uh, St. Peter has brought with him his Jewish Christian uh, companions as well from Joppa, so it's quite a crowd. And this latter group will act as witnesses about what has happened, will happen. Um, it looks as if St. Peter is in full flow. Certainly if you look at chapter 11, verse 15 of Acts, it appears that St. Peter had much more to say, but God is intervening. Good morning, Frank. Yeah, rain, rain, rain. Ooh, gardening. Um, rather soggy job, gardening in the rain. Anyway, here we go. Verse 44 of chapter 10. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many came with Peter, as many as came with Peter, in other words, the whole bunch of them did, because the gift, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. 
for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that they should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Um, see the journey is there now. A guava tree grows slowly but well. Well done, and Tom. Mine are also growing quite well. Um, they need a fairly sheltered spot. The ones I put out in the open here, they died in the winter. All the others were out all winter and they grew very well. Joan, these guava trees uh, came from Batramine as seeds to this country. I've been eating guavas in the garden and just stuck a few seeds in my park, pocket and then came back here. That was about a year ago. So in Batramine at the moment, the guavas should be in full fruit. Hmm, it's making my mouth water. Um, right, if you want to really make your mouth water, water, then get onto Joan's Instagram site and go and have a look at the cakes that she's been making recently. <laughs> wow, from Batramine, yes. I have a little bit of Lebanon in my garden as well as in my heart. Right, anyway, enough of all that. Otherwise, nobody will talk about anything other than gardening for all the rest of this. Let's go bit by bit. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fed upon all those who heard the word. Now, that's quite interesting in itself. So, speaking these words, ta rimata tafta. So, rimata, um, or rimata, probably rimata, isn't it? Um, these words so just these words while well, he's saying these things could be another way of saying it um a remata was also something like a sort of app um a saying so you might say training cats and dogs that sort of saying uh, while he was saying these things um those who heard the word and here we've got a different word so Rimata to begin with, these words, these sayings, and the second lot were uh, uh, tus akuntas ton logon. And here we have the word logon. The word logon means word. And uh, maybe even we could put this in capital letters here to say those who are hearing these sayings, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the logos. Um, it's a different thing. The Logos, of course, the Word of God is Christ. And so we can think in a slightly different way. Um, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard Christ. Um, so speak, Peter speaks, he's saying the sentences, but they hear Christ, they hear the Logos. Um, the word Logos can also mean message. So he's speaking these words, they heard the message. They got it, in other words. They really understood what it was that he was talking about. But he didn't need to speak very much. If you look above there, uh, he tells them, you know, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. It doesn't say anything at all about baptism. Uh, it doesn't say anything about them receiving the Holy Spirit either. And it may well be that St. Peter had uh, two levels of person who is going to come into the church at that point. There'd be the Jewish people, and then you'd have those people who are Gentiles. Well, it could be that he was expecting the Lord to tell him that they must now become Jewish and then become uh, Christian. We don't know. Nobody sat there with a the microphone and asked him. And those are the second. Whoops. Anyway. While he is still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Okay, and that is a really other important thing. The Holy Spirit, without invocation, without being asked to do anything, falls upon the household. So the usual order of baptism, followed by receiving the Holy Spirit, with invocation, by the way, is reversed in this particular case. The Holy Spirit acts with his own agency here. 
God acts. He's not going to let St. Peter work it out. He's showing him that this is something new that God is doing. The Holy Spirit goes wherever he pleases, and in this particular time, the Holy Spirit chooses to fall upon this Gentile household with all their Gentile friends. Good people, but they're Gentiles. Now, where the Holy Spirit has led, the church is going to have to follow. Um, this is going to be a very different thing. So we have God's agency here. Without St. Peter having to puzzle it out any further, he's seen the vision, uh, he's talk, spoken about it once, he's going to talk about it again. Um, they have just this extraordinary thing happens, the Holy Spirit descends upon them. Well, what do they think about this? And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many has, as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So those of the circumcision, that means the Jewish Christians. And the word they're astonished is the word that we get the word ecstatic from, which means standing outside yourself. In other words, they were blown out of their minds, you could say in English. Um, out of their minds, ecstatic, um, blown away by this. They, <laughs> you can imagine them going home and saying to the others, well, we saw with our own eyes and we're absolutely astounded by what happened. Um, not at all what they had expected to see. Not only that, but they saw the Holy Spirit had not just been dripped upon them, or a little tiny spot of Holy Spirit had gone on them, but, as they said, it had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Sorry, I should say, he had been poured out over the Gentiles also. And that unexpectedness of it, added to the fact that it is poor, that the Holy Spirit is poured out upon these Gentiles, emphasizes that it is a gift. Okay? When I receive somebody into the Orthodox Church, um, and it comes to the point where they are chrismated, we say the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is then poured out upon that person. You can allow the Holy Spirit to go away again. And the Holy Spirit doesn't need to stay with you. You yourself have to stay faithful to God. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit will obviously withdraw from you. But also the way it is described here, poured out, um, really emphasizes that way that God acts in abundance. He doesn't act with timidity. He doesn't, of course, God doesn't act grudgingly. God acts. When God acts, he acts fully. We can see this in everyday creation. When God decides to create things, he doesn't just create a little blob on which we walk around, a small little garden. He creates the most amazing universe. He doesn't choose just to create things that are simple and easy and obvious. Um, and, you know, if you think only a couple of hundred years ago, less than that, uh, the idea of everything being made up much less than that, being made up of atoms, was a revolutionary idea. Um, even recently, the idea of things being made up of uh, elements, different types of things, um, so that um, iron was a very different thing from um, rust, the two have very little in common with each other in, say, the 17th, 18th century, and even 19th century mines. And it's only now that we think about um, iron as being a particular thing and oxygen as being another particular thing, the one reacting the other to create iron oxide. This is 
This is a revolutionary way of thinking about things. And then if you look at an atom, you can divide it up and up and up and up and up. And just the other day we had um, Professor Higgs die and the Higgs boson particle and all that sort of stuff. He described it, he said it's like, I love the way he described it, he said it's rather like a fish, clever fish, swimming in the sea, who then suddenly discovers a water mo molecule. <laughs> um, I think that's a wonderful way of thinking about this particular thing and how extraordinary the creation is. And we're just looking very small, but then if you look on a grand scale of the solar system, our own universe, uh, well, our, our um, galaxy and then the universe beyond that, and goodness only knows what beyond that. We don't know. Only goodness does. And that goodness is God. Okay? Where on earth is come to? Oh yeah, God's abundance. Even even in creation we can see it. He didn't just create all the things that we needed to have, but there is the most amazing diversity of plants and animals and bacteria, fungi and so on in this world. If you look in just one teaspoonful of soil, there is a, a whole world entire. Um, which you just tread on, you don't even notice. Extraordinary, wonderful. The, the generosity of God. So poured out as a gift. And we're meant to say to ourselves, ooh, this reminds me of the book of Joel. And so it should. If you have a Protestant Bible, you will find that this passage is in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. If you have an Orthodox study Bible and therefore have a copy of the Septuagint on you, you'll find this is Joel chapter 3, the entirety of chapter 3, just five verses. Joel chapter 3. After this, it shall come to pass that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And in those days I shall pour out my spirit on my servants and upon my handmaids, and I will give wonders in the heaven and upon the earth, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes to pass. And it shall be that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved from Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord himself said, and there shall be proclamation of the good news to those whom the Lord himself called. So a bit of a description there, I think, of the crucifixion, um, and then the proclamation of the good news to those whom the Lord himself has called. Evangelization is mainly God's work, of course. Okay, um, there we go, um, this great abundance, not only, as I suspect they thought in Joel, but the all flesh was Gentiles, they never thought all flesh meant young and old, male and female, but um, all flesh, even Gentiles. Now at this point you have to imagine and reimagine the normal Jewish um, reaction to the idea of Gentiles. It really was a question of bring out the sick bags. Gentiles, ooh, makes you want to vomit. Um, and yet, this is what God is doing. Really blowing the minds of those Jewish Christians to the point where they're really shocked by what is happening. What on earth next, they'd be saying to themselves. But what on earth next is this? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. <laughs> this was even more surprising. Um, now, the speaking in tongues leads to them magnifying God. Okay? Um, rejoicing in God. And by magnifying God, it doesn't mean to say make God any greater. It means that God in your life becomes greater. Okay? And uh, you can tell whether somebody or other is in the Holy Spirit. If, as time goes past, 
they spend more time with God, that person um, rejoices in God more, God becomes more and more the center of their lives, uh, God becomes all in all to them, then you can pretty well guarantee that the Holy Spirit is acting upon them. Um, some people ask questions about speaking in tongues. It is a relatively common thing that happens, but most people keep it quiet to themselves because um, the church discovered after a while that people were showing off, speaking in tongues to show off that they were super spiritual rather than just in the church, which is actually the super spiritual part, made them think, oh, well, I am better than you. And so as time went on, spiritual fathers and mothers told people to keep tongues to themselves. Shut up about it. Go and pray if you want to in your bedroom. Say whatever you like in whatever way you wish to. Um, and I met several people who were ex-Pentecostalists who became orthodox on the grounds that uh, they wanted more charismatic involvement, not less, and charismatic involvement that the Pentecostalists and others of that ilk could not give them. So is it genuine? Certainly can be. Can it be abused? Certainly can be. Is it difficult within the church? Certainly can be. Is it a blessing from God? Certainly can be. Okay. But the great thing is that when anything like that happens, you magnify God in your heart. In other words, God overwhelms another part of you. You allow the Holy Spirit to come in and change you. Not something to show off about. So, St. Peter is looking at all of this, and he has to make a response to this, and he says this. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water, that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Okay. Um, so, St. Peter realizes that they have received the Holy Spirit in exactly the same way, without being bidden, without being asked, without uh, calling upon the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit descended upon them, rather like it did in Pentecost, in fact exactly as it did in Pentecost. And they would have heard these people speaking in other languages. Um, so. They, are, they have been overwhelmed by God, and he's saying, okay, what happens now? Uh, they need to receive baptism. Why? Because that is what the church does. It does so in obedience to God. Normally you baptize, and the person receives the Holy Spirit. In this case here, they receive the Holy Spirit. But still, the sacrament must be done. They need to have that completed within them. That is also important. So baptism is clearly important to St. Peter. There are some ecclesial groups or sub-ecclesial groups that say that baptism is not so important. You need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, indeed you do. Um, but you also need to be baptized. It is a sign, an outward sign of what is going on inside you. Your sins are being washed away. So baptism is important in and of itself. And here we have some of the sacramental teaching of the church being underlined. These things are not just, um, I remember being told in, as an Anglican by a priest, I disagreed with him by the way, that the baptism wasn't really for me or for anybody being baptized, it was for other people to see that you belong. I don't think that is true when God says that the baptism is there for the remission of your sins, then the baptism is there for the remission of sins. God does not act half-heartedly or without much in the way of a push. Okay? 
um, in verse 48 it says that Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Well, um, who is he commanding? I think he's telling, uh, the two lots of people he's commanding. He's telling, first of all, Cornelius et al, that they need to be baptized now. But he's also commanding those other Jewish Christians to get on and baptize them. They've been hanging back, they're still mind blown. Now he's saying to them, come on, get on with it, get on and baptize them. There's a slight possibility here that there's some reluctance on the behalf, on the part of those Jewish Christians to do the baptism. But St. Peter, with his apostolic authority, says, baptize them. Get on with it. Do it now. Um, there's also, of course, the fact that St. Peter saw what had happened, and this shows that he accepted what had happened. Sometimes people see things happening and they won't even accept the uh, evidence of their own eyes. He saw and now he has to accept. Um, Peter and the others confirm their acceptance by staying a few days, a last little bit. Then they asked him to stay a few days and he did. Now, <laughs> Chapter 11 starts off with the Apostles and those in Jerusalem hearing what's going on. <laughs> and they're pretty, pretty astounded as well. We'll come across that tomorrow. But I want to emphasize again this importance of St. Peter staying with them a few days. Jewish people did not, and often even now, do not stay in the houses of Gentiles and won't eat what, they've, what they have cooked and made or given them. They won't, because their religion tells them to stay apart from other people. And they're not in the business of converting anybody else. They're just in the business of maintaining faith themselves. So be it. Um, but here we have something really interesting, and that is that St. Peter, a good, faithful Jewish person, actually enters into the house of Cornelius and so on, and not only does that, but he stays with them. He resides with them. Presumably, therefore, he ate with them, uncircumcised, non-Jewish people. This is a shocker and actually shows a complete departure from traditional Judaism into something that is now quite new. And this quite newness is going to upset Judaism all over again. They hate with a passion the idea of the church at that time. And now that they are converting people who are Gentiles and bringing them um, into Christianity, they hate it even more because it would be seen as a pollution of some of the teachings. And say, not only do you corrupt the teachings about the future Messiah, but you're telling filthy, disgusting, non-Jewish people, Gentiles, that they can be part of this as well. Okay? So, on that extraordinary note of something brand new being done, we will think about praying for other people. I can see, actually, lots of people being saying things. If we don't get on and pray for others, you know what happens, we don't get around to it. Uh, so let's do that now. Yeah, I'm hoping you said. Um, so we're going to pray for Alex and Ben. Did I write this down somewhere else as well? Oh yeah, I did. I wrote it down. It's on the holy table. In the Prosky Um Let me just see if I put it here as well. Yeah. So pray for. Alex, Elizabeth, Benjamin and Simon, all of whom are, have mental health problems, and for those who have chronic problems, for Joseph and Judy, I pray for Ben and Brian as well, who are also ill, and for those who have cancer, for Yanis and Philip, Athanasius, Popsy, Angela, Jennifer, 
um, the Princess of Wales, the King, for Daniel and for Anthony and for the wife of one of the priests, all of whom are poorly uh, with cancer. The Lord may send down his healing upon them. Um, if you could also remember to pray for each other, of course, and for the goings on in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially in Gaza and Jerusalem, and for wise heads as they deal with all that is going on there, much of which is going to be pretty appalling. Um, pray too for peoples in um, Russia and Ukraine and all the horrors that are going off there too. Okay, um, right, let's see what people are saying. I might not answer all these questions, I'll need to get on myself in a moment. Right, where are we? Uh, uh, Jay says, good morning, Jasia, good morning, Jasia. Uh, good morning, Natalia, God bless you and keep you. Teresa says, her ancestor from the Bekar Valley gives you a reason to visit. There are lots of good reasons to visit the Bekar Valley. Uh, I visited there, actually, it was nearly disastrous, <laughs> but I did have an, an unbelievably delicious meal in a little um, restaurant which is at the head of the Orantes River. Beautiful little place. Just thinking about the food that I ate there is making my mouth water. It's a beautiful day. And everybody had been terribly um, hospitable. And they said that we were the only Christian priests they'd seen for a long time, the Muslim restaurant. Um, and they refused to let us pay for anything other than give them a tip, which was very kind of them, but embarrassing. Um, everybody was having a whale of a time there. It's a really beautiful, really lovely place. And the river was full of fish, particularly trout. It's just lovely to see. And a great big, uh, what are those things called? Um, mulberry tree and the sycamore tree over the top of us so we're in beautiful shade next to the cooling river it's a really hot day that day very very hot day <laughs> and all the way through the Bekar valley this incredible green crop was growing i was looking at it thinking that can't be what i think it is and when i looked more closely and asked father hanania to stop the car and i got out and had a proper look it was indeed what i thought it was which was um, acre upon acre, hectare upon hectare of cannabis. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Those naughty children. Um, uh, so there you are. She was a metri from Aita. <laughs> Maybe she grew cannabis as well. Well, there we go, Teresa. How exciting. You must go there. It's, it's a beautiful valley. It is quite extraordinary. And you go to the head of the valley. You go up into the hills, up into the mountains, and um, you go through desert. Then, and it's wonderful, actually. The desert plants are incredible, really, really interesting. Then you go over the top and down, and it's as if you've arrived in Britain, pouring with rain, cloudy, dank, cold, very lush, lots of greenery everywhere. And, as you, and it's only when you sort of look more carefully and think, hang on, hang on, hang on, these are not British plants growing around me. And uh, <laughs> very few people with blue eyes and blonde hair, uh, that you realize that you're still in Lebanon. Wonderful. You're suffering though, back there. There's one village that, during the time when ISIS colonized the hills, they had at least one missile hit their village every day for a year. And well, they carried on living there. Ahmed, got something, Ahmed, God bless you and keep you. Teresa says, only God can save me, but I have to choose to follow him. We do. Uh, Frank, amongst God's many blessings to all, something have many medicinal gifts. Garvan says, it must be something have many medicinal gifts. But yeah, there are many medicinal things in all of creation. Um, Maria sends some nice pictures of flowers. They're actually hibiscus. If hibiscus makes very nice tea, if you pick the leaves of hibiscus and you mix them with cooking soda, it produces a very strong uh, painkiller. 
that's used all that all through Africa when women are going to have a baby. Teresa says, was St. Peter considered a bishop at this time? And I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, nowadays, our bishops are considered to be apostles. So he was an apostle and he was producing bishops. Um, and then the apostles became like, um, um, the, the, sorry, the bishops became like um, apostles to us. And Jazzy says, who are Gentiles? That's a very good point. I didn't say. Um, they are people who are not Jewish. So you have Jewish people, then everybody else is Gentile. Jazzy says, rather off, off topic, therefore I probably won't answer it. Are we waiting for the prophet Elijah? Nope. Jesus said he's already come in the form of, of John the Baptist. Second coming, or he came. And are we now waiting for Jesus Christ's second coming? We are indeed waiting for his second coming. But the second coming comes, is here. Uh, the Lord came, the Lord comes all the time, the Lord will come. We say all three things of those things all in one go. Uh, yeah, may the Lord have mercy upon them. They are the best cooks. Well, I'll tell you what, they were jolly good cooks in that little restaurant. <laughs> Ah, guava. Yes, guava has lots of medicinal things about it, yeah. Um, well, the Lord says Elijah has already come. Um, yeah, anyway. Now, during the fast, before midday, I'm feeling very hungry. <laughs> Hello, Ben. God bless you and keep you. Um, I hope you're doing well. Now, today, I have got a slightly different microphone. It'd be interesting to see whether this was better or worse than before. So you might like to tell me. If you liked all of this, then you might like to give a thumbs up to it underneath. You may even like to share it with somebody else. And you might like to subscribe, even click on the little bell, uh, and so on and so forth, um, if it was helpful to you. If um, it wasn't, then don't do any of these things. <laughs> and go and find somebody who is better for you. That would be better. Okay? Uh, Jassy says it sounds clear and it's crisp. The microphone is very clear. Jolly good. Well, that's good news. Let's see. I'll, I'll try it myself later on. Okay? Um, so thumbs up on the little thumbs up underneath the thing. And Teresa says, yeah, it's good as well. I can see two or three people put the thumbs up already. Good. Right, well, pray for me. I am not sure whether I'm going to be here tomorrow. Um, I might have to be somewhere else. I'm hoping to be here tomorrow, so you'll just have to um, check your phone and see what happens. Thursday, all being well, that will be different. Okay, your prayers. God bless you and keep you. Bye-bye.